our point. There we go. Wonderful. So, um, no, thank you. Thank you so much, Julie, and thank you to um, Diane Michel. And, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to, to attend this conference um, this morning. Um, what I'll be talking about, the, my, the, the topics I'll be talk, discussing is I'll introduce just, diff, you know, um, briefly introduce different ways that the visual arts and medicine have interacted with each other in the past. I'll describe some of my own personal background. Um, and the research studies, in, including um, my most recent study um, working with Dr. Rockwood and his patients at the Memory Clinic in Canada. Um, I'll discuss um, in ways that in, uh, um, work actually created on a more personal basis, work that was created by my father, Norman Gilbert, and then also um, introduce the recent Memory Serves exhibition um, and symposium that was held here at the UNO campus. Um, I'd like to be able to just before to, as always, just be able to thank um, all these people. So all these people, the work that I'm going to be talking about today, um, the people who are listed here have either been terrific mentors or collaborators um, associated with the work that I'm talking about. Um, but I'd also like to, for the purposes of today, give a special um, mention to Dr. Kenneth Rockwood. Um, and then also, as always, to all the participants, um, not just the ones who I'm talking about today, but also and many, many others who have worked and participated in my studies um, over the last 20, 25 years with such generosity of spirit. So I think when we, when we initially think about the arts and medicine, we can readily think about images like these, the sort of anatomical drawings by, for instance, of Leonardo da Vinci. And so these drawings, these incredible drawings, um, you know, it's important to realize that these drawings are not just an amazing, you know, an amazing example of, of drawing and an amazing example of Leonardo's powers of observation. But, you know, they're also the product of artistic impulses, subjective impulses. And um, so to a certain extent, Leonardo wasn't just drawing what he was seeing, he was also drawing what he was feeling as well. And it's that, these aesthetic elements that make the works beautiful, um, you know, that and enable them to still to continue to, not just to be used in medical education, which they are, but they still engage us because they have these aesthetic elements. And it's that fundamentally that the arts in all their forms have the capacity to do, is to attract us, to engage us, to create resources, means of engagement around which um, we can um, generate new reflections, new realizations, and you know, and and, and generate um, discussions that maybe otherwise may not otherwise have happened. A way that the arts have been able to, I'm going to show you now an example of how the arts have maybe allowed us to illuminate to a certain extent the uh, the patient experience. So some of you, I suspect, are maybe familiar with these drawings um, by the artist William Uttermolen. Um, and so these, you know, that these are a series of three self-portraits that he carried out um, as his, as he was living with dementia and as his, as his um, disease progressed. And so I think when we look at these drawings, we sometimes feel that we can recognize maybe some of the feelings of isolation, some of the feelings of frustration, anxiety that William may have experienced in, in abundance. Um, but as is so often the case that the, with when it comes to using the arts, they can be you know, um, poignant with paradox in as much that you know, we sometimes feel that people living with dementias, having lost so much, they have nothing left to give. And yet I think some drawings like these prove that notion wrong. Um, leaving us also to ask, does dementia undermine creativity or does it just change its energy? And so to situate, to situate myself, um, I grew up, in, so some of you will have probably already gathered that I'm not necessarily originally from here. So I grew up in Glasgow in Scotland um, and I grew up in a house where art was being made all the time. And so this is a painting that was carried out by my father. Um, I'm the child in the middle holding the book, looking at my mum. So I'm the, the red figure in the middle. Um, and, I'm, and the picture also depicts my brothers, two of my brothers and my mother. So growing up, you know, I grew up, my mum and dad had both met at art school. My mum was an art teacher. My dad continued to work as an artist um, all his life. They'd met at Glasgow School of Art. And so it's maybe not surprising. I too ended up going to Glasgow School of Art and ended up painting paintings like these, which actually also depict my mum and dad. 
Um, so I used to spend up to nine months on one painting, which was a big undertaking for me to a certain extent, but it was in many ways an even bigger undertaking for the sitters. And so, um, you know, I often sort of joke at the, the only people I could have sitting for me were the people who liked me enough to spend that amount of time with me. And so more often than not, that meant that I was painting my mum and dad. Um, and there was maybe one or two other people who sat during those years after I left art school, but I was kind of working in a kind of solitary way. Um, but detaching myself, although I cared deeply about the people I was working with, I cared deeply about the people I was painting, I insulated myself from their views of the pictures. And so to a certain extent, I was aware that it takes a certain amount of courage at the best of times to sit for your portrait. Um, but whether if the people sitting at my, you know, it wasn't uncommon that the people I would be painting would take genuine offence as to how I pictured them. You know, I had my mum in tears because she thought I made her look too heavy at times and so on. Um, so, you know, the way that we respond to our own portrait is 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 very dynamic and, you know, there's a vulnerability there. Um, but as I say, you know, if the model didn't like the painting, it didn't necessarily make it a bad painting. And if they did like a painting, the painting, from my perspective, it didn't necessarily make the picture a success either. So, to, you know, there was a, you know, I did insulate myself from the views of the people I was painting. However, my life and working practice were to change dramatically. Um, when I was invited by maxillofacial surgeon, Professor Ian Hutchison, to leave Glasgow and work with him in one of the busiest hospitals in London, um, to work on a commission to paint his patients who were undergoing surgery for head and neck cancer. And I was working with his patients, painting them before surgery, during, after the surgery, but then also in the operating theatre, where I was able to get information, drawings, photographs that would allow me to do pictures of their head unveiled during surgery. And so I quickly realised that the detachment that had kind of sustained me um, while I was working up in Glasgow was with the people I'd been painting up there would, would be completely inappropriate in this setting. And the relationships that created between myself and the patients, people like Henry, who you can see here on the left, were to become a critical part of my working process. Later, as a result of the, save, well, the, the resulting exhibition, which was called Saving Faces, um, it toured North America. And, and one of the venues it came to was, was a place I hadn't really heard of before, which was at Omaha, Nebraska. And so as a result of the exhibition coming here, actually, to the UNO Gallery, which is situated just in the building I'm, I'm in right now, I was then asked by Dr. Virginia Ater and Dr. Bill Lydiot, who at that point were um, faculty at UNMC, to become artist in residence for a portrait, for a two-year portrait study um, at UNMC called Portraits of Care. And so these two portraits are part of a collection of over a hundred portraits I made in collaboration and representing patients and caregivers attending the teaching hospital here in Omaha. And so the project sought to use art, specifically portraiture, explicitly as a research me method to explore notions of illness, recovery, care and caregiving. And so consequently, I stayed on at UNMC to carry out my PhD, which sought to explore the experience of portraiture in a clinical setting. You know, so I wanted to, up till then, any of the research that was being carried out with Saving Faces and with Portraits of Care was really very much focused on the final image. How did the final, Im how did the final image, the final portrait impact the sitter? And how did it speak to the audience when the exhibition was exhibited? And to a certain extent already, I, was, I felt that, they were, that, that the research was missing what was certainly a critical part of my experience, which was the, the relationship that was engendered during the portrait making process. And so really for my PhD, um, I sought to explore, you know, really dig deep into that experience. Why was it that the people who you think might, might have been most sensitive or vulnerable to being portrayed, why was it that they responded more positively and more richly to their portraits? And so ultimately my study, um, having carried out a study with a small cohort of head and neck cancer patients attending UNMC, most of whom were older adults, um, the themes that emerged from the study and from the analysis was that for both the artist and the sitter, as we sat together working on the portraits, we, ex we experienced these, these five emergent themes. The first was that we had to embrace uncertainties. So there was inherent uncertainties in the whole process. The people I was working with, the patients, 
we're dealing with their own the, their own the uncertainties of their diagnosis of their prognosis. Um, they'd never had their portrait drawn before. They'd never been painted before. We'd never met before. Um, I never know what a picture is going to look like at the beginning. Um, you know, there was no hypothesis. We weren't saying if you sit for your portrait, X, Y, or Z may happen. It was purely exploratory. Um, so we didn't know the end at the beginning. We had to develop trusting relationships. So I'd already, I've already alluded to how, uh, how be, that became a critical part for me to be able to function, for me to, to frankly be able to get over my own anxieties working in a clinical setting. For the participants themselves, they valued the relationship that we generated, that we engendered together. And at the same time, they felt what was also curious is that purely by looking at the portraits of the other participants, that they said that just by looking at the other images before they'd even met the other people, that that alone was able, allowing them to engender a feeling of a sense of community, a sense of fellowship with the other participants that diminished that sense of isolation that can be so prevalent for people living um, with cancer or with chronic pain, et cetera. We engage in reflective practices. As an artist, I'm always engaged, you know, you're always reflecting. Every mark I make is a reflection on the mark I made before. You know, even when I'm intently working at the easel, I'm reflecting, and then every now and then I need to step back and come up for air, and that's another type of reflection that I'm engaged in while I'm making the pictures, while I'm engaging with the participants. The participants themselves, so especially the older adults, the older adults who were on the study, talked about how sitting for the portrait allowed them to reminisce and look back in their life in a way that they hadn't necessarily had the opportunity to do. And whether that was being done verbally, just by tell, them telling me about what they'd done, what their life had been like, or whether it was in those more silent moments where they were kind of reflecting back on their life, or maybe in a, maybe in a way, in a more mindful way, reflecting just on the moment. Um, these silent moments were again something that the participants reported was something that they valued and hadn't necessarily had um, the opportunity to do so in the, in, in previously. We told stories. I actively wanted to know their story and frankly, they wanted to know my story. And not only did we get to express ourselves, we were also, you know, we were also listened to. So the telling, you know, so that expression of story was a, was, was a fundamental part. And as a result, of embracing those uncertainties, of the relationships that were generated and the reflections that that created, of being able to tell our story and to be heard, we all felt a little bit stronger as a result. We all felt maybe a little bit more empowered. Some of us may have even gone through a little bit of a healing process. And so for the rest of my, my dissertation and my research, I then made the case that these five emergent themes parallel salient aspects of clinical interactions. Um, but also bearing in mind that we're all going to be patients and caregivers at some point in our lives. I think I, you know, I also made the case that they, um, they echo um, important critical aspects of any compassionate relationship that any of us may enter into, either as a patient or as a caregiver. And so although everyone experienced the disease deep, um, differently, these same themes apply to the participants I worked with on a two-year research study I worked on with um, in a studio which was um, ensconced in a memory clinic um, at um, Veterans Memorial Hospital in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, I was brought to the clinic um, by geriatrician Kenneth Rockwood um, to work with his patients. And so the following images are from that study. And so this is my studio, which was right in the middle. There was a window which I could look onto everybody who was coming in and out of the memory clinic. And so the study set out to observe the interactions and explore the experience of older adults and their partners in care through the development of drawn and painted portraits. And the data we collected included the artworks themselves, transcripts of the conversations between myself and the sitter. I kept a journal reflecting on the study as a whole, all the individual sittings and any other, any other observations I may have had. Ultimately, all participants took part, who were able to, took part in a semi-structured interview at the end of the study. After consent procedures were completed, each participant visited me in the studio. And so here, here they would sit for me for an hour or so at a time while I would draw them. We soon broadened the study to include people like Catherine, a clinical social worker, 
who you can see on the left, and Betty, a nurse who had been working at the memory clinic for over 27 years. For Catherine, participa participation helped her, as she said, become more aware of the art and everyday interactions in her social work practice. She even authored a paper reflecting on the challenges for a clinician in making a diagnosis while also attending to the patient's narrative, allowing the patient to, be, to feel seen and heard. And so considering her experience as a participant and sitting for her portrait, she explained, there are similarities between the process of the artist seeing the entirety of the scene and the process of a clinician assessing a patient holistically. Both artist and clinician are powerfully influential in their capacity to represent the personhood of a, sub or of a subject or patient. During portrait sittings with the participants, in this case like Brian and Lindsay, the discussions and conversations that permeate the sittings were rich in openness and poignancy, illuminating their story and to a certain extent my own story. Our conversations were an outlet which facilitated greater mutual understanding. Considering the overall experience, Lindsay stated, I think it's been very valuable. It puts a human aspect into, you know, the research and treatment. I think that's a very important part of educating doctors and healthcare workers and people in general. I was looking at the portrait of the two of us in the garden. You know, there's no telling which one is the patient. So it really emphasizes that this is somewhat an invisible, it's not like somebody has a visible disability. I think that's important for people to realize. I think it was a privilege to be part of the study. I really do. I think it opened up ideas to us or to me anyway. The quality of the unfolding relationship is reinforced for, for by and allows for the more silent and intimate process of the portrait making to flow with purpose. And so the silence, that silence is not an empty void. It creates a symmetry. It may feel uneasy at first, but it can engender moments of profound connection and reflection that can be as, as immediate and instantaneous as any verbal interactions. And so the intimacy and sensitivity en engendered during these silent moments can be even more profound if I'm working with a participant like Dave, who you can see here on the left, who found verbal communication challenging. Such moments gave us both the opportunity to exchange glances, observe each other, and still communicate with a profound purpose. When asked if he had any regrets about participation and having his portraits made, Dave wrote, no regrets. God gave me this di di diagnosis, and it's up to me to make the best of it and to accept any opportunities that come my way. Sitting for my portrait was a wonderful opportunity. Maggie, his wife's response to the portraits was more nuanced. She stated, we look rather sad, but that is reality. In quiet moments, I reflect on how, these disease, how this disease has changed our lives. I think you have captured this feeling with the portraits. No regrets. It was, it was, I think it was good. I got to know Cecil and Beverly as they sat for their portrait starting in January 2019. Cecil at that point was 82 years old and had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease three years before. During the home visits, I would draw them both and also take photographs. Cecil sadly died in 2020. They'd been married for 58 years. After Cecil died, I met Beverly once more when asked to reflect on, on their participation, Beverly said, I'm glad the pictures were done because I think people have to realize that this is what happens. You know, the confusion, the sadness of the whole, what happens with this disease, how everybody's affected. So it takes a toll on everybody's life that cares for their loved ones. And as I said, you captured that moment. This is Lawrence who I worked with intently for the whole two years, right from the beginning until the end. When I first met him, he had just lost, at the age of 91, he had just lost his wife and his eldest daughter, Penny, um, within a month of each other, to cancer. Penny had died at the age of 51 and had lived all her life with severe cerebral palsy. And so Lawrence, even at the age of 91, had been Penny's primary caregiver for over 50 years. He had also been a top class cyclist in the United Kingdom before where he'd also, he, he qualified for the Tour de France and he did all this before emigrating to Canada with his family. 
when he met when we first met he was still living ind independently he was still able to you know to drive to be able to come and visit me in the studio to be able to fend for himself however i'd been working with lawrence for about nine nine months visiting him weekly when i was told by his younger daughter patricia that he had fallen and broken his hip and so lawrence felt dreadfully despondent during these early days after the surgery he he was suffering from as is not uncommon from post sur post surgical um, delirium and although he grew tired at times when i visited he was still happy to be drawn and as he lay in bed looking fragile and suffering from the effects of his medication um he communicated um how he felt so frustrated that nobody took um his his delirium and his the, the hallucinations he was having seriously um and so as i say he was incredibly despondent and to the extent that he said he stated why do we go through all this what's the point is it going to do any good you know so at this point he really was you know there was a m incredibly moving conversations where he was really um, giving up or he was talking as he was talking about wanting to give up however he later later stated maybe it's better to ignore it and just keep going on reflecting on this 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 large portrait of him in the hospital viewing viewing it later he stated the one in the hospital looks like what i was at that particular moment but i can't check because i can't see myself it's good it's not really a portrait it's a time capsule i continued to work with lawrence for a further year after he got out of hospital he was now much frailer and required constant help to get around um he needed help to get up in the morning he needed help to be put to bed at night and um, people had to come in to to give him breakfast lunch and dinner he rarely went out and so lawrence would of, often voice his thoughts on what the purpose of the portraits we made together and that the study might have and so the last time i met him in person he stated i'm quite happy doing the study even if i don't know exactly why i don't expect to know anyway but i know that it it's something that's important and eventually it's going to help somebody and so lawrence also recognized the collaborative nature of our time together saying my energy has got your portrait on the paper it guides your hand we both engaged with the process helping each other express reflect and find meaning and even healing through the medium of portraiture and so the relationships that i had with lawrence and others were dynamic ambiguous and uncertain and re reflecting on this we recently published a case study that draws on my work with lawrence and on physician john lawner's seven c's of narrative based care and so there are the seven c's are a conceptual framework which can help um one understand the nature the shape and form of narrative based care and so the seven c's are context conversations curiosity complexity challenge caution and care and so our paper proposes that these elements that are embodied in the portraiture process which can offer a useful framework to consider ethical challenges of caregiving so when we view a portrait where we so when we view a portrait we are viewing not just a picture of an individual but a picture of somebody being looked at therefore the image is a testament not just to those who are portrayed but also to the portraitist portraitist as well so it's a testament a portrait is a testament to a relationship however the meaning doesn't necessarily reside with the artist or with the sitter it also includes the viewer and so the portraits invite and allow for the viewer to be able to bring their own experiences to the picture and so as oscar wilde wrote every portrait that is painted with feeling is a portrait of the artist and he said not the sitter the sitter is merely the accident the occasion it is not he who is revealed but the painter it is it is rather the painter who on a colored canvas reveals himself now to a certain extent i don't you know i want to make the point that that's maybe how people you know some people view portraits and to a certain extent this is to, this this is true my voice is in each of these portraits i bring my own assumptions and preferences and choices 
but the work is also deeply empirical, created with a constant vigilance of my own biases. It requires a restrained attention and a constant awareness that my voice should not overpower the voice of the participant. It is my job to support and articulate visually the experience and presence of the sitter. And so as I continue to work in the hustle and bustle of the hospital um, at the memory clinic in, in Halifax, my dad attended to his own artistic challenges um, as he continued to work in his more solitary practice back in Glasgow. And so this is my dad. Um, um, his name was um, Norman Gilbert. And this picture, this was taken in 2018 when he was 92 years old. He died two years ago. Since he'd met my mum, Pat, at art school, he'd drawn and painted her hundreds of times over the previous 70 years. And so each of my father's paintings, including this one of my mum climbing into bed from 1954, embodies a phase in his life and also in her life. And so for each of his compositions, he would execute numerous drawings like the one of my mum that you see here as preparatory sketches towards the final compositions. However, 12 years ago, my mum was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. In those last years, my dad continued to draw and paint her. In these later compositions, the Alzheimer's, although the Alzheimer's is never overtly referenced, I think once one, is a, one, once one is aware of the context of the creation, they become a powerful visual record, not just of a husband and a wife and an artist and a sitter, but also a depiction and a testament to partners in care who mutually supported and comforted each other. And so with my work, with my own research, I was becoming more and more to realize the role that the arts can function as a means of engagement to communicate these relational elements of medicine. Mm -hmm. However, when I was told that my mother had had a massive stroke from which she would be, un from which she, she would, that left her unable to move and, and communicate and from which we were told she would not recover, I was still absolutely staggered to be told that as my dad kept vigil, by her bedside for what would be the final week of her life that he brought paper and pencil to the hospital to enable her to draw. And so the following drawings that I'm going to show portray my mum, my mother as she lay dying in hospital for just over a week at the beginning of August 2016. My dad described how he didn't have any qualms about carrying out the drawings. He just hoped that he could do it justice. However, when describing the first drawing that he tentatively carried out of her, of her hands, he stated, and I quote, oh, I was absolutely terrified that I would not be able to do it. I was completely relieved when I found out that I could do it. I thought all I need to do is to try and do it better. But I wondered under the circumstances, would I be able to do it? And I was relieved to find that I could. His reasons for doing the drawings were numerous. When commenting on why he did the drawings, he said, because I thought it's what I do. I mean, some people might have read a book, you know. It didn't enter my head to take a book, but it did enter my head to take a sketchbook. I could have put on a radio or a television. I didn't put that on for the whole time. And I didn't think there was anything strange about doing the drawings. It was just something I'd spent my life doing. He also said, it actually took my mind off completely what I was doing. One of the doctors did come and saw that I was drawing, and I said, it is all right, it just keeps me sane. But really, when I was doing the drawings, I forgot. I was just drawing Pat again. And I thought I'd drawn her thousands of times before. I did, to some extent, forget. And so there's a paradox here. As he said himself, the drawings helped him forget. But he could have, if he wanted to, if his aim was to forget, he could have left the room, he could have distracted himself in all kinds of different ways. And so it's important to realize that the act of drawing as well as helping him forget, was still enabling him to engage profoundly with what was happening. And so for him, drawing was normal. It seemed appropriate, as he had drawn my mum so many times before, but ultimately drawing allowed him time to reflect and find solace in the familiarity of drawing. And so although we realised that my mum would not recover, we were also told by doctors that she could survive in this state for weeks. And so at that time, I was still in Canada, I'd just been home for a week or two before because my dad had had an exhibition in Scotland and I felt at that time that it was probably when I said goodbye to my mum that time that it was maybe for the last time. And so in my own mind, I felt it would be better 
to wait to come over for the funeral so as to maximize, maximize the time that I'd be able to spend, time, spend with my dad helping him after. And so the fact I was not there led my dad to consider a further reason or role for the drawings when he stated, all the time I was doing them, Mark was the one I thought would appreciate them more than anybody else. It didn't dawn on me that really it was in his line of work and it would somehow or other fit in with a whole lot of what he's been doing. I said to him that really I was doing them because I thought this would be something that I would be able to show him. He wasn't there himself, so I thought, well, the next best thing is to draw it. And I think that Mark would have liked to have been there and couldn't. So I tried to do the next best thing. And so here he's really, for the, actually for almost for the first time in his life, was kind of recognising that his pictures, that these drawings, that his work carried a, a narrative, that he was explicitly recognising the capacity for pictures to tell a story and allow us to be able to share in that experience. This last quote is his account of making the final drawing of my mum. And so it continues over the next two slides. And he said, reflecting on those, that last drawing, he said, at the end, I was sitting in the chair beside her and I was covered up with a hospital blanket. And I woke up at about two in the morning and felt her arm and it was colder than usual. And I looked at her chest and it was going up and down slowly. So I knew she wasn't dead or anything. But then I looked at her mouth her mouth was really close compared to what it usually was. But she was still breathing, but very slowly. And then I started counting between each breath, and she would breathe. And then I could count one, two, three, up to ten. And she would take another breath. So there were long gaps between each breath. And I sat doing that for about 15 or 20 minutes, just counting between each breath. And then there was the last breath. She just took a breath, and then there was a wee gurgle, and then there were no more breaths after that. And I thought, I've drawn her in every position up till now, so I'll need to draw her this way too. And I did. So the first thing I did after she died was draw her again. And then, once I'd done that, I opened the door, and one of the orderlies was sitting outside the door, and she said, I'll go and get the nurse. And then I came home about three o'clock in the morning. And so looking at the last drawing, a week or so after doing it, he reflected, perhaps people would find it strange that I was able to do it under the circumstances. But it wasn't a difficult decision to make. I could have just gone and called the nurse, but I thought, no, I have another drawing to do. And so I think you can certainly see that the drawing is different, maybe a little awkward, maybe less confident than the others. And so for me, I think he's struggling to express and record not just what has happened, what he, not just what he sees, but also what he feels. And I think you can sense that, there is, that she's no longer alive and that there's a notice, noticeable difference, that there's been a shift. But to my mind, the drawing is not bad or poorer. It's a remarkable, raw, honest, vulnerable, loving drawing that enabled my, you know, which enabled to, my dad to be able to articulate and to be able to try and make sense of what was happening. So my mum had also been an artist and an art teacher. And as I mentioned before, having attended Glasgow School of Art, where, where, she, where she had attended Glasgow School of Art, where she met my dad. And so this is my mum sitting on the wall, drawing while she was an art student. And she actually taught me art for three years at, her, at high school. So when she died, it was particularly touching and uplifting to hear from those who knew my mum as an art teacher and be told how she helped and inspired so many to articulate themselves through their art and how she shared her belief that the arts in all their forms can help live one's life with passion, compassion, and care. Last September, the portraits I created with Dr. Rockwood at the Memory Clinic in Canada um, were exhibited alongside my father's drawings, um, end-of-life drawings of my mum, here at the UNO Art Gallery, um, at the UN, here on, the, on campus. Both collections, both art collections recognize the capacity for the visual arts to be forms of research and that they have the potential to create narratives that cannot be expressed in other forms. They turn what were private experiences into something shared. It was also wonderful to be able to share these works with so many classes, so many students 
allowing them to be able to integrate the pictures into their learning and inviting them, the students themselves, to consider the fluid roles that we are all asked to play at some point in our lives when we care for those we love or fall ill ourselves. The arts in all their forms give us a reference point, providing us with new ways to consider the relationships between those who give and those who receive care. The relationship that patients have to their own illness, mortality and well-being, and the method, and methods and means of medicine's provision. Um, I'm grateful to um, um, Michelle for sharing, I think, links to um, recent, in 2020, uh, um, and then also in July of this year, I edited two special issues. The first one regards to port, um, focusing on portraiture in healthcare, and the one in July um, to regards to um, arts-based research. Um, both journals were were special issues with the with the American Journal of Ethics, and so there's a link um, that um, I'm grateful, I'm happy to be able to share with you all. Where there's more articles, so Catherine's articles, the 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 article with Lawrence, is, along with other articles, regards to some of the research I've already spoken about, and research from you know prominent researchers from across the nation using the arts in different ways to be able to inform. Um, our, our reflections on, on um, caregiving interactions and, and of medicine in general. And then also the, the AMA also generated uh, a, a continuing education module, interactive um, continuing education module, um, which again, Michelle has, um, I'm grateful for, to Michelle for sharing with you, I think, in the chat box for this talk. Um, so that finally, I just want to be able to say thank you all for allowing me to come and speak to you today. And I just want to take a further opportunity, as always, just to be able to give special thanks to all the participants, some who are no longer with us, um, who have partic participated with such generosity of spirit um, on the studies I've spoken about and other studies I've carried out over the last 20, 25 years. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilbert. You know, I, there's a comment in the chat, in the question and answer, that really summarizes your presentation. And then we'll certainly open it up for questions. But uh, Krista says the stories and images are so unbelievably powerful. Thank you for sharing. It underscores both the importance of art and the role of arts have throughout our lives and how it, how it is essential for so many uh, for communication and overall well-being, not just for those that are the sitters, but but as yourself, as the, the drawer and the artist, uh, and how we can now look at this in a humanistic way when we are meeting face-to-face -face with our clients day-to-day. -day. And again, uh, another comment, I'm grateful to be in your, to be in your present for this presence in this presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, this is very informative. Thank you. So we invite uh, Dr. Gilbert to stay on with us as you come up with other questions. I think everyone's taking it all in as well. You know, this is, this is where our practice becomes humanistic uh, in, the, in, in whatever line it is in the healthcare professionals is to see beyond what we are getting and driving in terms of our structured assessments, but to see more. So let's wait uh, for comments, additional comments and questions. We, we have a good 10 to 15 minutes of Dr. Gilbert's time, so we sure want you to, to engage him further. Dr. Gilbert, as um... A question that's come in is, what is your current research or future research in this space? So, no, uh, it's, a, it's a great question, especially right at this moment, um, because I've been working on these studies for a long time. And um, I do have a current study that I'm working on with that started during the height of the COVID pandemic and um, working with frontline healthcare workers. Um, and so the data, again, similarly, the data included the pictures themselves, the portraits themselves that are still ongoing, as well as journals and interviews and so on. Um, and one of the things that struck me about that was um, how 
for you know I've worked with I've had the privilege of working with people um, in London and Canada here in Omaha you know some some of the people I'm working with whether they were patients or caregivers or you know sometimes you you know I'm acutely aware I'm potentially working with people during the most traumatic moments of their lives um, and um, you know and I've worked with people you know who who know that they're coming towards the end of their their life um, and you know, and other people going through incredible challenges. And yet so often I'm struck by how amazing, you know, how people's capacity to cope um, and to be able to, um, you know, and how, although many of my interactions are incredibly moving and poignant, they were rarely kind of emotional. You know, there was rarely kind of, you know, rarely did the people I worked with kind of break down and so on. There, there was an incredible, um, um, yeah, coming to terms with the situations they were in. The reason I'm saying that is because that was slightly different with the frontline healthcare workers. So in many ways, so the, 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 you know, so the study that I'm currently working on, it starts, every, every participant started off doing an interview and the first question I would ask them is, so what's it been like the last eight months or the last 12 months, you know, whenever, you know, whenever it was that I first met them after the pandemic started. And just being asked that question, it was remarkable how many of them just reflecting on and trying to answer that question broke down in tears. And so I've really never worked with in many ways a more vulnerable, vulnerable population as the healthcare workers, you know, and I think that just testifies to the uncertainties um, that they were facing in a professional and personal capacity. And, and the portraiture again, like, you know, as, you know, similarly with the other studies I've worked on, that the portrait making process engenders a, a kind of immediate in intimacy um, that could could be awkward or could be burdensome, but actually it provides you know very quickly turns into something that's it, it, that's you know a, a much more you know a comfortable intimacy, which helps engender a sort of trusting relationship um, and allows you know for the participants who I'm working with to feel comfortable and to to express themselves and allows me to function as well, you know, so, you know, they assist me in my own anxieties um, and so on. And, um, you know, so the, you know, so it's an, an, an amazing, so that those were the, that's where I'm now. However, I, I'm, I do think the, the kind of exploratory nature of my studies, I find I'm, I'm very comfortable with, but I, I sometimes feel it's a little bit disingenuous now that I, you know, that, you know, um, because I've done it so much now, there's patterns, there's very definite patterns that's happening. And so I feel now, really, the, the, the research I've done deserves maybe further research into, you know, well, why is it that, you know, what is the nature and form of the reflections that the portraiture develops? Um, but these more kind of slightly more focused questions I'm not as comfortable, you know, I'm comfortable with trying to keep, my, the, for me, the challenge is to maintain a sense of curiosity and to keep my, 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 my perspective as broad as possible. And the notion of kind of narrowing that perspective is not something that I'm, I don't think I'd feel as comfortable with. Um, you know, and I think the participants, you know, I'm not an art therapist and I don't claim to be, and I don't try you know, I'm not a tr striving to make the participants feel better. However, if they do feel better, if there is a therapeutic benefit, we acknowledge that and, you know, record that. Um, but I think the participants recognise that the relationship, you know, I think that they, in, if I was, if I was um, you know, if I was seeking a, a therapeutic dimension to this, then I think that would be narrowing the vision. And I think that could then mean that I would then be blinkered to other things that are happening. So the challenge for me is to really maintain a sense of curiosity as much as possible. And frankly, that's, that's tough. That's, 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 that's quite a challenge in itself. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Diane. I see you reading the question. Hey, thank you. That was a beautiful answer. Uh, and again, echo what, uh, let me go ahead and go to the next question. Dr. Gilbert, why do you think a portrait with your version of how these patient looks elevated their effect and mood from what is previously was, for example, his post-surgery? So why do you think a portrait with your version of how these patients looked elevated their own effect and mood? 
So I think so. I mean, it's curiously when you you know, and the, and the question. Thank you for that question. And talks and the question I spoke about post surgery. So maybe if we focus on the people who were you know whose appearance had been altered through surgery, and um, it was remarkable, really, that you know the many of the people I was I was working with who have under you know um, you know some 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 of the people like Henry had like remarkable facial difference as a result of their disfigurement. You know, many of the people I was working with didn't like looking at photographs of themselves and didn't like looking in the mirror. Um, you know, we know that people who have facial difference or are even scarred that they're having to take on all kinds of, they're also ch they're challenged by the physical journey, but then also by societal um, attitudes towards them. You know, research has shown that people with facial difference, um, that we, you know, as a society, we're, we can be guilty of thinking that they're less um, less reliable, less honest, less attractive, more prone to violence, less intelligent, all these negative attributes. And many of the people I was working with were having to, um, you know, to, to, to confront um, in their lives. And so um, the notion of me bringing a portrait artist in, bearing in mind that I was acutely aware that I genuinely offended people in the past, I rarely got commissions because... You know, people didn't necessarily want paintings of themselves. They might like the painting, but they did realize that I never flattered anybody necessarily. Um, so for me, initially, when working in the hospital, I was I felt like I could be like a bull in a china shop. Um, and what was remarkable is that wasn't the case. But as I say, I realized I kind of intuitively realized at the very beginning that I had to shift the way that you know my attitudes. You know, that initially that 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 distancing from the participant that I kind of functioned with prior would be hugely inappropriate while working with um, in the hospital. Um, and so, so I was much more aware that I was being taken right out of my comfort zone and so then had to be much more vigilant and then much more vigilant and aware of the sitter's perspective and the sitter's view. And But as I say, the relationships were rich and the relationships and friendships continue to this day. Um, but I think my my feeling is is that the, it wasn't so much the, the images the, the the positive response to the images was partly that the participants realised that the image would be able to be a testament to their experience that they recognised that the images were a kind of authentic testament to their experience and that they had the potential to be able to speak to others to testify to their experience but then also in, testify to others in a way that might be able to help others help others in a similar situation. But I still think that fundamentally that the, 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 their response was hugely influenced, that they also saw that the pictures were a testament to the relationship. And that relationship, those friendships, frankly, that were engendered during the process of making the portraits, I think was a fundamental part of why and how the people who I worked with responded so positively and so richly. Thank you. We have another question for you, Dr. Gilbert, uh, from Teresa. The clinical power of your work is beautiful and profound. Are there any close approximations that mental health practitioners who do not draw or paint can integrate into their work with patients and their family members who are aging and dealing with terminal medical problems? Any suggestions there? I'm, you know, really, and I'm, I, I'm, there, I, you know, I, I'm a huge advocate for the role of the arts in all their forms to be an amazing way of being able to open up, um, you know, or to be able to shine a light on these relational elements. But again, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and I, you know, specifically drawing, I don't think that you have to, you know, if you're spending time with somebody. And if you're caring for somebody, then I think, you know, by all, even if you're not a drawer, even if you're not a trained drafts, you, you're not trained in drawing or the arts, or you, you maybe haven't drawn since like many, 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 many of us won't, you know, draw as children and then kind of stop around about when we were 10. Um, but again, that notion of even if you're not, where even if drawing doesn't come naturally to you, that notion that the drawing does generate an intimacy, it does, you know, you know it does kind of fill the, the, fill those silences with something that can be very purposeful and can be a, you know, and the drawing can kind of facilitate, you know, profound connection. Also, just no matter what, if you, you know, it's important for, I think, for all of us, whether we're, we're trained artists or not, to jettison any kind of 
assumptions of what we think is a good or bad drawing. And ultimately, any drawing that one may do, you know, by making that drawing, you're still making this permanent, tangible, aesthetic form that still kind of then kind of, you know, makes that, you know, the, 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 the temporary nature of experience into something that, that, that is that you mark that experience and it becomes something that you can then that you, that you and others can then still reflect on and so I don't think that you need to be a sort of professional artist to be able to do that but I think I do believe that the arts um, have the potential to be able to um, to be able to offer um, comfort to be able to offer a way to testify to experience, but in ways that can be comforting, in ways that can be healing, but then also in ways that can be disrupting, you know, that it can disrupt our ways of thinking, that it can create new perspectives in ways that in 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 using means of communication that other, you know, that is specific to that medium. Um, you know, so there's things that drawing can speak to or can refer to exceedingly well, but there's limitations there, you know, so every, no matter how we choose to communicate, there are opportunities and restrictions. And, um, you know, and I think that the arts offer these other, other forms of, of, of communication that um, it would be churlish to ignore, really. And, and um, you know, and I, I'm incredibly grateful working here in Omaha, where the medical community has been so supportive um, in using the arts and the medical humanities um, really for the last 20 years. And it's terrific to be working in the medical humanities program here, working with and teaching, you know, aspiring healthcare workers here at UNO.